Or should I talk about unity? Of course. How during the trial of Angela Davis, a movement of justice and equality was fostered in hopes that she would be freed from all charges against her. This organized network functioned as an ecosystem that influenced change. An ecosystem where faith was like rain and nourished all the organism. An ecosystem where justice was the climate and love was like carbon dioxide that fed the trees. As hope filled their lungs and they became intoxicated. An ecosystem where the spirit of the movement shines so bright that even the sun had to look for shade. As I thought about her activism, sacrifice, and service, I had an epiphany. What could influence such courage, such desire for freedom? And what could inspire others to change the world? And I thought, it was love. Her love to do more and to mean more to a movement about freedom and equality. It was love that, that ignited the civil rights movement. And so as Angela Davis comes forth and speaks, let's not forget that it was love that drives us. It is love and compassion and understanding for not only black people, but for all people and for all humanity. <laughs> and so now, I'll formally introduce Angela Davis. Thank you. 
was passed. And if you didn't already know about uh, that effort, uh, most of you probably saw the film Lincoln last year, right? Some of you. It was an interesting film. I always say the most important scene in the film was at the very beginning when Lincoln had this conversation with the two black soldiers. If you got, if you arrived at the theater late, this is the most important part of the film. for many, many, many decades to come. 
and for the purposes of uh, reproducing the slave population, uh, those who would have been free had they followed the condition of their white fathers uh, remained enslaved. Du Bois also wrote the slave could have no access to the judiciary. A slave might be condemned for condemned to death for striking any white person. Now consider the devastating impact this had on, on people who were enslaved, but also the dehumanizing impact on those who benefited from slavery. In this country, freedom came to be defined as not being a slave, as not slave, as not black. And the voice continued, never he wrote, in modern times has a large section of a nation so used its combined energies to the degradation of mankind. The hurt to the Negro in this era was not only his treatment in slavery, it was the wound dealt to his reputation as a human being. Nothing was left, nothing was sacred. And while the best and more cultivated and more humane of the factors did not themselves always repeat the calumny, they stood by, consenting by silence, while blatherskites said things about Negroes too cruelly untrue to be the word of civilized men. Not only then in the 40s and 50s, he wrote, did the word Negro use its, lose its capitalization. But African history became the tale of degraded animals and subhuman savages where no vestige of human culture found foothold. Now, if you, if you consider the magnitude of the impact of slavery on the institutions, the culture, the ideology, uh, this psyche, the collective psyche of this country, you would assume that whoever wanted to put slavery behind them would initiate a process of purging of the country of the influence of slavery. But there has never been a consistent attempt to purge the economy, politics, culture, and the spirit of the United States of this catastrophe. And that has allowed it to continue to spew its damage. I thought about this a great deal when um, I watched the coverage uh, about the death of Nelson Mandela. The 10 days between his death 
forgetfulness, but rather transformation, revolutionary transformation of self, transformation of, of social relations. And so I watched white South Africans talk about what it means, what it, what it meant to have been associated with apartheid and then become a part of a new society that was attempting to build a world without racism or sexism or homophobia or economic exploitation. And when I think about the difficulty we have in this country of honestly talking about our history, of talking about the colonization of the indigenous inhabitants, and recognizing that, that, that we are a settler nation. Talking about slavery. And so this is, when I say that with all of its contemporary difficulties, South Africa has come so much further than us uh, in acknowledging and understanding its, uh, its past. It seems to me that um, that, that should inspire us to get started. Um, and so that actually motivated me to, to revisit slavery. about 
the efforts to achieve women's equality that happened in legislatures, state legislatures all over the South when former slaves were elected to those legislatures. We, we tend to have an image of that era that comes to us from the most racist propagandists. And I'm thinking about uh, people like D.W. Griffith, whose birth of a nation created the ideas that are still with us. That, yeah, black people were elected to legislatures, legislatures but they were, they were ignorant, they were stupid. You know, there's that scene in Birth of a Nation. Uh, everybody should see that. Because that was the first major film in this country. And that film, that racist film, that has all the stereotypes of, you know, the black uh, rapist uh, who goes after the, uh, the, 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 the white girl, played by a white character in blackface, by the way. Uh, uh, and that I was actually talking about the scenes in the, legis in the South Carolina legislature where the black legislators are have their feet up on the tables and they're eating chicken and they throw the chicken bones uh, across the room. Uh, but you know what Birth of a Nation is about, right? Yes. And you know that it was based on this uh, novel called, Thomas Dixon's novel called Klansman. And Birth of a Nation was about the rebirth of this nation in the aftermath of radical reconstruction. And that rebirth was symbolized by the ascendancy of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, okay, we're talking about slavery nowadays, largely because of another film. Because uh, we've had a couple of films about slavery in the last year or two. The most recent one is uh, 12 Years a Slave. And last, was that last year we talked about Lincoln and Django Unchained? The Butler. Well, the Butler, that's right, because there's that scene in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, I tried to name uh, the films. These films allow us to create popular conversations. And I try to think about uh, the films about slavery. Because we, we, have, we have these images in our mind, right? We all know what slavery looked like. At least we think we do. Because we walk around with these images. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes the images come from films like. Um, Gone with the wind. Because I tried to I tried to name good, solid, critical films on slavery, and I only came up with a few. Um, and then I came up with Roots, the TV series. And some of you are old enough to have experienced it. And some of you have seen it later, right? But when Roots was shown in the 70s, it was actually this amazing experience where people, it was probably the first time in the history of this country where uh, people sat down and, and, and watched this series on the history of slavery in this country. But then I remember thinking at the time, I was excited like everyone else, but then I saw the way the, the series ended, and it really bothered me. Because it was, of course, based on Alex Haley's, um, and what was the, the subtitle? Um, it was like History of American Family or something of an American. But the thing is, the end of the series 
makes you realize that it was a series about the rise of the black middle class. Right? I mean, who is it? Like Chicken George? Right? He's able to buy the land and so forth. And in a sense, it was about the possible slavery in the past. It was a narrative of triumph. And we've had these repeated narratives of triumph. Even 12 years a slave is a narrative of triumph. I'm very happy that 12 years a slave has been so widely distributed and has been nominated for an Oscar and I guess it got the Golden Globe Award for Best Film. But I'm also disturbed that it has taken this long. And moreover, I am disturbed because the main character of this film, as wonderful as it is, could seemingly only be a free person of color who was kidnapped into slavery. It was as if his prior freedom invites us to identify powerfully with Solomon North. Because we imagine ourselves from the vantage point of freedom being kidnapped into slavery. But the vast majority of slaves were slaves from the time they were kidnapped from the continent of Africa. And what would it be like to identify with someone who had not been free? Or someone who had not had the opportunity to get an education? Someone who was not able to read and write because, because he or, or she had been forcibly prevented from doing so. And what if the main character had been a woman? And then I asked myself, why, with the exception of Alfred Woodard, who did an incredible performance, I think the best performance in the film, and Alfred Woodard played the wife of a white slave holder. And I use the scare quotes because, of course, it was not uh, uh, legal for black and white people to, to marry. But all of the other women are portrayed only as suffering beings without any agency of their own. They are represented as, um, as the objects of violence. And that bothered me. Because I know that vast numbers of, of, of women participated in struggles against slavery. Ran schools, ran midnight schools, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et now, 12 Years of Slave has been praised for presenting on um, screen for the first time something we might call the realities of slavery. Slave subjectivities with which we might identify. But it seems to me that this film also relegates slavery to the past. Yes, it is important to understand the past. But what if the past is not past? So what if the past is also the present? And so in order to understand the relationship between slavery and the prison industrial complex, it, it is important to recognize that slavery did not end in 1863, nor even in 1865. It is important to recognize that that seemingly inconsequential phrase of the 13th Amendment which punitively abolished slavery. How could slavery be abolished by an amendment that was only about six lines? I can, I can share the whole thing with you. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime wherein the parties shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. That was section one. That's the whole of section one. 
Section 2 is simply, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. How can you abolish slavery with something as puny as that? <laughs> Especially when you consider the vast influence that this institution had on, 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 on the way people thought, on, 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 on the whole notion of work, on the whole notion of punishment. I could, I could talk about every major institution in this society and explain the extent to which slavery exerted an important influence on that institution. Now, the, this phrase of the 13th Amendment is often used, the, the, the accept as a punishment of crime, whereof the parties shall have been duly convicted. It is often used to indicate that a new system of punishment was launched inside this loophole, inside this exception. We can say that something akin to slavery emerged through the punishment apparatus. And of course, folks, we often see imprisonment as an analogy. It's being sort of like slavery in an analogical relationship to slavery. And that's helpful, but I think we need to go further. Michelle Alexander uh, writes about uh, mass incarceration as the new Jim Crow, and I understand she spoke here last, was it last year or a few years ago, right after her book was published. But I would like us to consider that slavery was allowed to continue through a peculiar form of punishment that was as ubiquitous in the South following the abolition, the legal abolition of slavery, as it has become hidden under the detritus of history. And I am referring to the convict police system. Douglas Blackman argues that actually slavery was not abolished. That it continued through the particular kind of punishment that was meted out to black people. And I ask myself, why are we not familiar with, 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 with that part of our history? Why don't we know about this um, new slavery, what, what uh, uh, Blackman calls the, the age of neo-slavery? As a matter of fact, he says that we should stop calling it Jim Crow. Because Jim Crow, Jim Crow was a menstrual character. A menstrual character, a white menstrual character, a white man performing blackness. And why do we call that era, which was, which was an era of terrorism, why do we call it Jim Crow? See, you know, sometimes you have to question things that we take for granted. Jim Crow is a euphemism for what happened uh, uh, during that era. Why are we not aware of the slavery that continued up to World War II? Why are we not aware of its, in its inheritances? It's not that books haven't been written about it. There's a, there's a very interesting book written by Robert Perkinson. It's called Texas Tough. And he, it's about the Texas prison system and how it developed as a way of incorporating slavery into uh, the, 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 the mode of punishment, which meant that what we usually think about as punishment in the U.S., which gets started, we think, with uh, the systems in uh, New York and, and uh, Philadelphia, Auburn and, and Philadelphia, right? And which was uh, the, the penitentiaries that were supposed to um, rehabilitate. This is where we get the notion of rehabilitation from. Because the idea was that people 
or who was sent to prison would be sent to penitentiaries where they could be penitent and reflect on their crime and emerge as, as reconstructed citizens. And these were white men. Because women weren't really, white women weren't really citizens, and we know that black women weren't citizens. So. Uh, now, you know what? Slavery makes people feel guilty, doesn't it? Especially makes white people feel guilty. <laughs> Thank you. 
points out, and, and, and he's, he's really good at challenging the historians who say that, well, black people were not used to freedom. And so they didn't necessarily know right from wrong. And so therefore they committed crimes. And it was perhaps because they were poor, etc., etc. But they never asked whether it was due to the behavior of former slaves that this system developed. And what Douglas Blackman does is he investigates the uh, archives of the courts and the sheriff's offices and the companies, and he realized that there is absolutely no correlation between the rise in incarceration of black people and uh, crime, crime rates. What he finds a correlation with is demand for cheap labor. And as a matter of fact, these corporations, U.S. Steel and, uh, included, would tell the local sheriffs, we need labor. And the sheriffs would go out and they would conduct what they call roundups. So they would arrest black people, black men primarily, but also black women for no reason at all, for talking too loud, for failing to look down. I mean, they would just make up uh, offenses. And and so, according to um, according to, let me read this passage from <coughs> instead of evidence showing black crime waves, the original records of county jails indicated thousands of arrests for inconsequential charges for violations of laws specifically written to intimidate blacks changing employees without permission, for example. That was a crime to change employers without permission. Vacancy, riding freight cars without a ticket, engaging in sexual activity or loud talk with white women. Repeatedly, he wrote, the timing and scale of service and arrest appeared more attuned to rises and dips in the need for cheap labor than any demonstrable acts of crime. Hundreds of forced labor camps came into existence, operated by state and county governments, large corporations, small-time entrepreneurs of provincial farms. These bulging slave centers became a primary weapon of suppression of black aspirations. Where mob violence or the Ku Klux Klan terrorized black citizens periodically, the return of forced labor as a fixture in black life ground pervasively into the lives of far more African.
arrests, convictions, sentences are still similar to what they were during the period of the new slavery. So we can say that the ideological effect of the criminalization of blackness is still with us. As the linchpin of the prison industrial complex, what we might call racialized mass incarceration represents today the increasing profitability of punishment. It represents a global strategy of managing bodies of color. Just as in the aftermath of slavery, it was about managing free black bodies. Today, it is about managing bodies of color, immigrant bodies, or bodies perceived as immigrant, no matter how many generations they have lived here or in Europe. Uh, the prison industrial complex produces these bodies as surplus bodies, as disposable populations, put them all into a vast garbage bin, add some sophisticated electronic technology to control them and let them languish there. And in the meantime, create the ideological illusion that the surrounding society is safer and more free because the dangerous black people are locked up. And in the meantime, corporations offer it and poor communities suffer. Public education suffers because it's not profitable according to corporate measures. 
labor rights. And I think today it is incumbent upon us to understand the interconnections and intersections that bring all of our social justice issues together. So if we stand up against racism and heteropatriarchy, we must also challenge attacks on immigrants, the movement to defend the rights of immigrants is one of the most important civil rights movements.